thank you. Um, I know we are kind of ending, uh, coming to an end of uh, sci-fi, so we'll try our best to keep your attention in this uh, panel. Uh, this panel is about uh, exciting world of cross-border data flows, and exciting because uh, it also covers uh, data localization, it talks about security, it talks about um, the whole data economy, but uh, we'll try to simp simplify it and, uh, and make, uh, make sense and also give you some provocative thoughts of uh, where it is headed globally, some of the global models. So um, if you're all ready to start and settle down, um, I'm not going to introduce the panel. He's, uh, they've been already been introduced by Samir uh, uh, when they were walking up to the stage. So we will preserve time. We have time over here. We have 45 minutes from now. So uh, we have about four or five big topics to discuss. And uh, I'm going to right away get into it. So thank you, my panelists, for being here. Uh, as diverse a panel it can be from, uh, from across the world and experts um, in their own uh, fields, in their own uh, domains. So uh, my first question is that, you know, um, we've seen data flows, data localization requirements, uh, the issue of how data will get exchanged and what can, what can go where, um, being part of all bilateral, multilateral discussions. But very little has come out of it. In fact, we are seeing a, a lot more agreements, if any, on a bilateral basis rather than multilateral basis. And um, when it is becoming a, a data and a digital economy and the, within the fourth industrial revolution, why do you think uh, uh, this, is, this is not working out? Or what are the issues that, that we need to address to, for it to work out? And you know, this is especially important given India's G20 presidency, upcoming G20 presidency. So, uh, where where the digital track and the data track has been expanded. So, uh, let me let me start with Karthik, um, uh, f or your opinion on this. What will it take for us? And it has two parts. And uh, you know, I'll we'll, I'll ask the other panelists to come in and and uh, opine on that or intervene at the right points. But I would say two things. Where is where is this headed? Multilateral process, bilateral process. Um, the minilateral process, small regional processes, number one. Two, uh, how do we build trust into this whole process? Uh, how do we speed it up? And three, how do we balance, you know, between innovation and security uh, as we go, uh, go along, uh, especially which is relevant to startups? So you may want to address one or two of yeah. them or all of them. So first, uh, you are up, Karthik. So thank you so much. Um, it's, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to... Um, ORF and the organizers for bringing us all together. Um, so in a nutshell, a short answer would be we need to have multiple ways forward, multilateral, bilateral, minilateral, trilateral. And I think it's very healthy that we're having discussions on data and digital trade issues across all these different fronts. Um, if you look at the G20 and the G7, over the last couple of years, they've had very um, healthy discussions on data flows, on data flows with trust, DFFT, um, the G7 this year, the, uh, under Germany, there was a lot of attention and focus given, given to getting countries to think more clearly about rules around data flows um, with, among, with each other. So there's, I think, amongst the top 30 economies or so, there's a clear political understanding that this is an issue that we need to work toward. And there's a political consensus that data free, free flows with trust are a healthy and necessary thing we need to move toward. So on the sort of global political side, there's enough happening that could lead to kind of more concrete standards, agreements, and rules across different areas. And I'm going to focus on a couple of different um, kind of areas where there's a lot happening. Um, one is on the normative and the principle side. You have a lot of multilateral institutions like the OECD, the WTO, um, UNCTAD, that are really trying to lay out clear guidelines for their member states uh, to think more about how to uh, advance data flows and data sharing between um, uh, digital economies. So there's a lot of normative uh, work around principles, guidelines, 
that's happening. Uh, and in Asia in particular, I want to sort of highlight two um, specific frameworks that don't get a lot of attention, but, that, but, but they should. Um, the first is what's happening with the APAC privacy framework. Um, now, APAC, I mean, it's, it's, I mean, its uh, utility has been questioned a lot over the last you know, 10, 15 years. We've seen a lot of different multilateral economic frameworks emerging. Um, so the APAC sort of struggled to find a new, uh, a, a new function for itself. And I think it's, it's working toward that on the digital trade and, and, and the data area. And there's a, there's a lot of work happening uh, amongst APAC members on privacy. Um, including cross-border privacy rules, that can serve as a kind of a framework, a standard-setting guide that other APEC countries can also go back and adopt within their own countries. So that's one particular healthy sign, I think, um, in Asia. Um, the other kind of minilateral, so there's a lot of minilateral action happening um, in the form of what we are now seeing as digital economy agreements, or DEAs, or digital economy partnership agreements. So two or three countries or three or four countries are getting together, uh, having decided that digital interoperability and data interop interoperability is, a, is, 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 is key, and they are trying to kind of make their digital systems and uh, frameworks congruent with one another. So they're not thinking about data in isolation, that they're, they're thinking about it uh, with, say, AI, with cybersecurity, with payments, with e-identities. So there's a much more comprehensive uh, approach that's emerging through these DEPAs or DEAs, as, as they're somewhat known, across the multilateral space. I think I think this is really he a healthy innovation. Um, and so there are more countries. So for example, one one popular DEA is between Chile, uh, Singapore, and New Zealand. Uh, and the success of that has spurred other countries to want to join in to that DEA. So Canada. What you're saying, Karthik, is uh, you're seeing um, while the large multilateral process is going on, you're trying uh, minilaterals expanding into a slightly bigger group is the way to go. So I think what I'm trying to say is that at the multilateral level, there's enough political support and there's political consensus that data free, free flows with trust are something we need to work toward. But the details of that are being worked out in different frameworks, Very bilateral, good. multilateral, trilateral. And you're seeing that most concretely through these DEAs and DEPAs. I think that's one way in which more and more countries uh, can integrate their digital trade uh, systems and thinking about data in not just in isolation, but together with a lot of different challenges. Absolutely, and that's a very good, that's a very fair point. If I can bring in uh, Alice, uh, you from both, uh, uh, you know, uh, India and France have started doing a lot of work on this, especially given what Karthik just mentioned. If you can switch that off, yes. Karthik. Uh, um, and uh, we are already uh, working on our uh, the, the techno-legal framework that we have in India called the Data Empowerment and Protection Architecture. We are working with France specifically, but not related to that. What is your, how do you see it from a European perspective, um, given Europe has been one of the, Within themselves, they have a very strong uh, data laws and uh, uh, a lot of those uh, compliances slash uh, requirements many countries don't meet so easily. So uh, can I see your view on that? Thank you. So, yeah, I want to talk about the, um, the European uh, approach to data and, and also maybe the bilateral level of, of, of discussions and negotiations in, in, uh, in um, data privacy agreements. First thing I want to say is that we talk about the EU data policy uh, usually uh, as a whole, as one, one, one thing, as if it's one entity, but actually I think uh, we can look at the EU as well as an international regime in itself, as indeed it's a super, uh, it, it has both a, EU, a whole of the EU layer and, and the national layers. And the EU is trying to, to come up with a compromise between having an open market economy, protecting uh, citizens' privacy, and also dealing with the fact that national security or, or, and defense and, and, and sensitive um, uh, national security issues are dealt with at the state at the member state level. So you can, you can see the EU as already an, an international agreement in itself when it comes to, to data and some sort of uh, multi-layer multi compromise. And it's also international as in it has international influence. Indeed, you were mentioning uh, bilateral negotiations with India and other countries about um, adequacy. Um, and it has influence because even without adequacy decisions, there are countries that are sort of mimicking a little bit the, the European model. 
<clears throat> but so the, one of the questions is, uh, has the EU managed to influence its main trade partner, uh, the US, with which it would make uh, such a big difference if, if there was a bilateral um, agreement? And as we know, it's been going back and forth between uh, tentative agreements to no agreement over the past few years. And there has been uh, very recently um, a new um, executive order coming from, from the US towards a new data privacy uh, framework at the transatlantic level. And um, the question of trust was brought up, obviously, data free flow uh, with trust. And I think in the transatlantic uh, landscape, this trust question is a big issue because the, one of the main uh, problems is um, can we trust uh, the U.S. Uh, secret services and the use that they would make of the data that they, that they can access thanks to uh, extraterritorial uh, American laws such as the FISA. And so the, the most recent U.S. executive order uh, tries to limit the, the access uh, so as to reassure the EU, tries to limit the access of uh, um, uh, US uh, secret services to only legitimate objectives uh, with certain objectives that are prohibited and provides for a, a, review, a new review court to be set up for Europeans to be able to file complaints. Um, but uh, that still leaves some of the questions uh, un unanswered, such as um, what is legitimate in the national security, in the American understanding of national security, which is very broad and ever, ever broader, actually, uh, including uh, economic security, for example, as part of the national interest. And so how, um, how far can, can that go, uh, considering that we have no way of knowing what uh, use, the extent of the use um, of the FISA um, law by, by the U.S. Um, uh, uh, services, for example. And the question will be also discussed of the independence of the new review court that will be set up. And so I think we, we're going to have to wait for the uh, European Court of Justice to, to come up with its uh, evaluation of that new uh, potential uh, data privacy framework, but it's, pro it's still uh, not guaranteed. And so what I want to say by that is that even the bilateral level is very complicated. Uh, we see also with the UK, for example, that if the UK changes its da data privacy... You're yeah. saying bilateral between EU and... Uh... EU-US in that and particular case. So, and, and, and finally, but it will be a EU-US uh, master agreement which every country will have to read. Re, uh, yeah, then all the so, so that, countries that have to sign up. We are looking at a long process then. Exactly. They have to, to sign up to it uh, as well. So, uh, so because of this multi-level multi, multi -level governance. Uh, and, and we see also in the case of the UK that the UK is so far uh, has an agreement with the EU, has the adequacy, but they are considering changing their uh, national data privacy approach. And if they do, they might move away and might lose the adequacy. So what I want to say by that is that, well, first, there is a lot of legal uncertainty, a lot of legal changes, and also um, that uh, bilateral agreements can be reversed. And so even if you reach that bilateral agreement, you know, it's not necessarily um, the, the holy grail. And something maybe we can touch upon later is uh, personal versus non-personal data, because such agreements concern only personal data, but some countries like France are trying to push for non-personal data to also be uh, more properly uh, covered uh, in, in, uh, in uh, data flow uh, agreements. Thank you. In fact, um, uh, you know, um, and I'm, I'm going to uh, come next to uh, Mr. Narendra Nath, uh, India is also was um, making the Personal Data Protection Act uh, as just personal data, but we have taken that back and probably adding the non-personal data also to it, uh, to it uh, and having an omnibus act uh, come up soon. So um, with that, Mr. Narendra Nath, can I turn over to you and present um, what you think um, is, uh, is your view from a, from a very Indian perspective? Yeah, I, I think, you know, one of the things is regarding when you're talking of cross state border data flows is to have a laissez-faire, you know, attitude to it and then not bother about what data is flowing around. Uh, the only uh, issue comes about when you start looking at uh, some type of data and then decide, you know, this is a data that should not be flowing across borders or you should be having some control over it or you are interested in where this data, data is flowing. That's where the whole issue comes about. So, So the issue here is, you know, it's not the data. When you're looking at data, I think uh, you should look at, as you said, personal data, non-personal data, and also look at the categorization of the data and how sensitive one data is 
and then look at, uh, you know, looking at what data can flow across borders and uh, if some data is flowing across borders, where is the data flowing, what is the type of legislative and regulatory environment is there in that country. And these are some concerns that come about. So that is how it is. So if you see in India also, for example, if you look at the RBI guidelines that came about, so it's talking of certain data, you know, that should be processed and stored in India. It's also allowing some data to go outside for processing and then says it should be again stored in India. It also talks of some data that can be stored both in India and abroad. So it's, it's all, when you talk of cross-border data flows, it's one thing that you look at as categorization of the data and the sensitivity of the data to the individual and to the nation. And with both, both perspective and that's how it should happen. The regulatory and legislative environments in different countries are different. And the element of trust that you talked about, you know, that is also one important component in all of that. So when you look at cross-border data flows, when you look at multilateral neg negotiations and all, getting everybody into one bucket might be very difficult. So that's where I think this mini lateral or uh, bilateral, uh, you know, laterals is the new 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 yeah, way to go. What mm. You're talking about yeah. A smaller grouping of nations getting together and having similar systems, and there's an element of trust in that. They could have a higher level of threshold about what data can flow across borders. And uh, between bilateral, there could be much higher uh, threshold about what data can flow about. Uh, that's how it would be. And coming down to, you know, data is it's very important. It's not only a question of, uh, it's an economic value that it's got, and we have to use it for public good. And that's something that we have recognized in the country. And that's how, you know, we are putting non-personal data also into the overall framework and try to extract the economic value of the data and also use it for public good. Startups, and especially in the current environment, business environment, require access to data to develop these AI tools and come up with solutions. And that access is required to be provided. And many of the startups will be having businesses globally. And in that case, uh, you know, it's important that we look at this aspect of cross-border data flows and how do we facilitate that from happening? I think it's important. And there are tools uh, that should be looking at both in the terms of regulatory tools and compliance tools and monitoring tools that will require uh, to be established. That I think is a very big question. I know there are a lot of startups in this room and if they train their uh, AI models on a particular set of data and want to do that on other countries and without uh, a, a good uh, regulatory regime, either they are operating in gray areas or, or um, yeah. Uh, or they have a risk of, uh, of, you know, compliance failure in the future. So, um, yeah, what you said is very, very relevant. And I'll come back to, uh, to Srinidhi last, uh, but I want to bring in Michael on this because you brought about a very um, big issue, Mr. Narendra Nath, is on data localization. Now, data localization, anybody here from uh, lot of some of the sponsors also uh, uh, know that it's been a, one of the big issues of discussion globally. And... Um, uh, uh, I know, Michael, you were, when you were discussing outside, talking about it. So, uh, when is data, I mean, the question that I'm asking is, one is, of course, please feel free to comment on this bilateral or unilateral, um, uh, minilateral, uh, uh, minilateral kind of arrangements, but also, do you think one of the things uh, most of the countries will revert to is data localization slash mirroring as a safeguard to security vis-a-vis -vis, uh, free flow of data? Uh, well, thank you very much, and this is a topic that we've been working on a great deal in the last couple of years at Carnegie. Just last month, we released this report, which is called Data Governance, Asian Alternatives, and it's uh, four chapters, two by Indian authors and two by Korean authors, looking at how data policy is being shaped in those countries and the different models that they're using. I'm not a lawyer although I've spent a lot of time in Washington with lawyers and a lot of time in Geneva with international lawyers, I'm actually a physicist. And so I look at the world as, as a lot of forces pushing different ways. And in this area of data policy and data <clears throat> um, governance, we do have, within governments, a lot of forces pushing against each other. And that's why we really haven't resolved many of these issues. Uh, in our introductory chapter to this report, we talk about how resolving this issue is going to require digital leadership from the president or the prime minister in the key countries. The reason is because data issues cut across a lot of different agencies. And as I said, in the security agencies, there's a real push 
to keep the data close. In the economics ministries and those offices that are in charge of innovation and helping startups, there's a real interest in being part of the global data economy and sharing data with uh, other partners overseas. So right there, there's this con conflict between two different visions of the world. And that's where the prime minister and the president comes in. I, I, I was lucky enough to work in the Clinton White House with Vice President Gore. President Clinton had deputized Gore and told him, you take care of this digital stuff. And he did by bringing together the key agencies. And when there was a dispute, he would lock them in the room and tell them to come up with a consensus. That's not happening in most countries. And that's why it's been so hard to get these international agreements, because sometimes the economic ministers and the telecom ministers and the IT ministers, they all go off to their meetings and they all agree on the need to share data globally. And then the law enforcement people or the surveillance agencies, they're having their super secret meetings and they're agreeing that they should try to keep the data in country so that they can process the data, get the data they need for law enforcement actions. I'm very biased. I worked at Microsoft, IBM, Cloudflare, three companies that have a global presence and really rely on being able to move data everywhere and support customers everywhere. The model that we really should think about here is not data is the new oil. If you can erase that sentence from your brain, please do it immediately. Data should be like air particularly scientific data, non-personal data, data that we need for research. It should flow across the world just like air. And like air, different users will take different chemicals, different molecules for different purposes. And it will be used and reused and mixed. If you don't like that analogy, think of data like water. Most of the world's water flows around the oceans. Some of it, some of it is stuck in ice sheets. We can't get at it. Who knows what's there? And, and just a little bit of the water that we rely on is so special that we process it, we put it in bottles, we put fancy labels on it. That's a better way to think of data. Most of the world's data should be available very broadly. But it shouldn't be stuck in a few data oceans. And that's my, my real fear, is that the data is, is right now flowing into the data oceans being built by four or five giant companies in the West and maybe three or four giant companies in, in China. What we really should think of is a world where each of us have data tanks, just like we have a water tank at our house, and our doctor's office will have a data tank. And, and there'll be hundreds of thousands of these individual systems for maintaining the data about us will be able to access this data when we need it using intelligent agents, but we won't consolidate it under the control of one or two or five companies. These data tanks will be controlled by people who are responsible to me, not to Amazon, not to Facebook. The, the person who put this out best is a fellow named Sandy Pentland at MIT and he's written a book called Building the New Economy. And if I can uh, give you just one reading recommendation, read that, particularly the first chapter, and get the idea of this new model of a world where data is distributed widely, it's maintained by people who are responsible to me, not some major corporation. So Michael, can I intervene there? Yeah. Uh, it's a very noble thought. Uh, data as air and everybody has equal access to it. The users definitely... Uh, no, not equal access. They have access that to I allow. That, that, is, uh, that is what I was leading to, the consent-based access that people allow that. And then, th then the real question comes is, you know, how do they benefit from it? And that's where both the techno-legal frameworks will come in. But, um, you know, um, I just... You know, the, the, the whole Web 1.0 started with that philosophy. It got polluted as our air gets polluted over time. You're living in Delhi and pollution is very big here. If you're if you're here, please wear your mask outside. 
um, and and it's a uh, you know that is the fear that um, the you know the uh, people who have seen the degradation of web 1.0 to web 2.0 which was then siloed into this eight or nine big platforms across the world the data getting siloed so any case uh, it's a debate for another panel but today i i want to come to uh, shunidhi and bring you in into two aspects one is the value you know if somebody talks about a tank that i this is my data and i have a tank of reservoir i have a i have a power to use it myself or exchange it for certain goods what kind of um, legal frameworks do the users and where do the users come into this picture i mean we talk about platforms we talk about government we talk about policy makers how do we empower consumers with their own data that really that they are generating and uh, and uh, what kind of legal frameworks protections do exist and what what should also exist uh, when we do this uh, uh, mini lateral discussions Sure. And I have a related question to that, sorry, and maybe we should, while we're talking about the legal side, the regulatory side, I also want somebody to comment on, Michael, if you can, also on the technology side and Karthik, also on the, uh, on, the, on the technology side, if possible. Thank you. Sure. Thanks so much, Arvind, and hi, everyone. Lovely to be here. Um, I think you, you spoke about sort of giving users, handing them back power, um, and Michael had also talked about these uh, sort of competing interests when we talk about say different priorities for different frameworks. I think e each framework to govern data and to govern cross-border data flows would um, try and balance these different objectives of, of say national security or sovereignty of economic growth, economic uh, priorities and, and user rights. Um, perhaps there's one sort of driving force uh, for, for different frameworks, um, either of these, it's sort of a governance choice whether, whether you're driven by a human rights centric approach or um, or you know you 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 prioritize say economic growth over the others, but there is some balancing that happens. And if I could just maybe begin with talking about some of those different legal frameworks, I think Michael spoke a little bit about those those competing interests to just so just to supplement that. I think when we talk about economic priorities and a more sort of laissez-faire approach uh, to to data flows in 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 particular, which is historically associated with a regime like the U.S. Um, so say where economic growth is uh, prioritized, so. You you bat for unrestricted flows of data across across borders, um, and while user rights is a is a part of that, but perhaps one could argue that one is uh, one is kind of prioritized over the other. For instance, the U.S. Mexico Canada agreement, which which has data transfer provisions, which says that um, you should promote sort of free flows of data, avoid restrictions on on data transfers. The second approach is a more human rights centric approach, where um, like like you know your more consent heavy frameworks or more individual centric uh, frameworks, say something like the EU GDPR, where um, user rights are sort of prioritized. There are stringent rights around access, uh, consent-based sharing, uh, and, and, and so on, where you place guardrails also on data transfers. Uh, but perhaps not an absolute bar. There is that essence or, or attempt to kind of uh, balance there as well. So a framework like the EU-Japan Adequacy Agreement, uh, which of course does, it's, it's not like an open, it's an unrestricted flow of data. There are some checks and balances. Uh, but, but at the same time, while Japanese data protection law might not emulate the GDPR, there is an attempt to say, uh, back for trusted data flows there, but keeping user rights at the back of it um, as sort of the driving driving force there. And the third framework is um, the more sort of national security being being prioritized, say um, China or Russia perhaps, where, where there are more sort of hard localization provisions where um, from a national security lens, you're sort of batting for data to stay within within borders. Um, even within India, we've seen multiple approaches to, to how we govern data. We're yet to finalize our approach, and, and that also kind of speaks to how hard it might be to find any kind of global consensus, and even, I'd say, mini-lateral agreement, even consensus on those fronts, because for the last five years, at least, we've not been able to find national consensus either on, on what, what approach to go for uh, when it comes to um, not, not just data flows, actually, on just how to govern data, um, personal, non-personal, and, and all of these sort of different aspects. So perhaps a more uh, balanced model is, is what we'd, we'd eventually uh, choose, which, which confers some kind of user rights as well, uh, but, but, but perhaps not sort of an absolute bar on, on data flowing across borders. Uh, the question of valuation, I can, I can come back on perhaps. Uh, yeah, well. so the, the, uh, just to add, India has been 
I mean, from, for people who are following the Indian regulation and the India governance uh, thing, here is what Srinidhi mentioned. We are, we are saying that there is uh, the architecture that we have, a techno-legal framework, uh, regulatory framework that we have is called data empowerment and protection architecture. So it's balancing between empowerment that data can cause, uh, can create, uh, the, the valuation and the ecosystem it can do, but also protecting in the right uh, consent-based uh, uh, environment. So I think there is a balance that at least India is trying to strike, but uh, you know that remains how we do it when we go from a flow perspective. Michael, um, any comments you have before we come to um, the uh, you know, kind of I have, uh, everybody's addressed a few things that we had thought about talking in this uh, panel. So, but I do want you to comment on any techno frameworks that exist, any models that exist that have, you've seen in your experience work uh, yeah. when it comes to cross-border data flows? Well, I, I, I'm an expert tweeter, so I'll try to give you about four or five tweets. Um, and if you want to follow me on Twitter, I, I, I'm Mike Nelson. I was the first Mike Nelson on Twitter. I'm very proud of that. Um, there are 50,000 Mike Nelsons in America. Um, just to be real quick, <laughs> the uh, data empowerment and protection architecture is, is a real model. It's something we can learn a lot from because it has some of the key ingredients. It, it, it has the ID system that you have to have so that you can have the right access control and know who's accessing what data. You have to have logging so you can audit and understand access. where the data is flowing. You also need to have strong encryption and that's critical if people are going to trust these systems. And the thing that nobody has really done very well is providing very fine-grained access. Uh, you might have an incredibly sensitive database that has all sorts of healthcare records, but a medical researcher might only need to take four or five columns of the spreadsheet that don't have any personal information and yet could reveal really important epidemiological results. That kind of fine-grained access isn't built into most systems. The other place I would point you is in the United States, we've had a number of data infrastructures built for different sub-disciplines in uh, research, uh, some environmental areas, uh, astronomical data. Um, people want to get credit when they've collected a lot of data. And so these data sets are set up in a way that if I've contributed 10 years of data, I can ascertain that 1,200 people have accessed that data and these 17 papers were produced. And, and it's, it, it's a, a kind of sharing community, but there is this repository that's been built up. So I'd point you to that. And then I would point you to the work by Sandy Pentland on data unions and data trusts, because um, I think that, again, it's a, it's a radically different approach than the data exactly. oceans. I, I've worked on that uh, committee, one committee with her, so I'm aware of that a little bit. Thank you. Um, I'm going to um, change the format a little bit. Um, we're going to take uh, uh, from all my panelists who have already commented on a lot of issues around data flows, multilateral, it seems to be one of the consensus is by the time you achieve bilateral consensus, it will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, major multilateral consensus, it will be, uh, it will be too, too long a time frame. So you're seeing a lot of maybe multilateral leadership, but a lot of bilateral slash minilateral uh, consensus coming up. Uh, with that, uh, what I will do is, um, uh, you know, I'm going to ask a provocative question starting from, from Alice, um, is what are your worst and best case scenarios when it comes to cross-border data flows? If you had a, uh, uh, something that you lose sleep over, what would that be and uh, what would be your um, best case scenario, uh, how do we end up with in, in the next couple of years? Thank you. Uh, so I, I do think that we, we've talked about data in general without so much differentiation between the types of data and so much, not so much talking about the use of data, even though I think uh, Mike was just alluding to uh, use for, for research or, you know, um, health, especially health research and science um, purposes. And I do want to talk about the fact that there are, there are two trends that are going, in, going on in parallel. There is one trend towards more 
securitization of the data and including especially the, the sensitive data in the case of, of France and the, the new norms that they are developing about the certain like super high security cloud uh, for sensitive data, whether it's personal or sensitive industrial data. So that's, that's one trend that's going on. But at the same time, uh, at the European level, we also see emerging indeed data spaces, data sharing spaces, and um, the newly uh, voted uh, Data Gover Governance Act uh, is creating something new that I think is, is a good idea, which is data intermediaries that will allow um, companies and public bodies that have, that possess and create data, including personal data, to, through an intermediary, share it to including private companies that want to value that data uh, and use it for developing their products, etc. And through these intermediaries, you have a way, I think, which is the, the good case scenario, right, uh, where you can make use of that data while at the same time making sure that you um, preserve uh, privacy and, and, um, and individual rights. So I think there are both scenarios going on and they will coexist and that's okay. So what you are saying is uh, coexistence of the uh, the, the very strict norms on highly secure data being localized, being, um, you know, with the sovereignty of the nations being at, uh, at stake, the security being at stake, and second is this whole commons approach. But, uh, but where we head up and what, what data will go where and which, are, which is the sensitive data for which country, I think that's where most of these talks fail and what, what can, you know, what, what can what can flow and what cannot flow will we'll keep getting decided as we go along. So, uh, Karthik, your comments on that. Well, thank you. I was just going to pick up on some of the um, points about data models. And I think one one positive development that you see today is there's a lot of innovation hap in a hap happening around data intermediaries. I mean, that, that's a term that's interchangeably used of so data trusts, data custodians, data cooperatives, data collaboratives data sandboxes. So there's a lot of private sector action. There's a lot of uh, regulator to regulator action happening on these areas, which is very positive, um, specifically on sandboxes. Now, if you look at, you know, I'm, 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 I'm coming from Singapore. Uh, Singapore is becoming sort of a, um, a, 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 a country that's investing a lot in sandboxes, regulatory sandboxes. So there's recent agreements, especially within India, on fintech and, and financial data. So there's a lot of new models that are emerging where specific kinds of data can be shared with countries, different countries, with the regulators taking the lead, ensuring that there's enough, um, enough protections. So that's one area that I think that's really promising at the intermediary level with the introduction of sandboxes. There's a lot of private sector um, association standard setting which is happening around data that we need to really kind of pay attention to. So there's the International Data Spaces Association, which is a, uh, a coalition of 130 countries that are coming together to devise rules around data sharing and how private sector firms can work together uh, in terms of sharing data. The, the Japanese have really taken the lead on this front. They have a lot of different innovations on, on in this area uh, in terms of um, standard setting bodies. So there's Data X, EX in Japan, where, um, where there's a lot of different, different industries, whether it's academia, the private sector, um, government, they can all come together to share data in a very secure manner. Uh, and that's something that can be explored in other countries as well. So there's a lot of different kinds of private governance emerging around data um, alongside the minilateral that needs to be kind of looked and, at. Um, and in that terms is... of, and the final thing, in terms of what, you know, I'm not really, I mean, I don't really have sleepless nights about data. I care more about, you know, whether the data is secure and the kind of cybersecurity threats that we are seeing today and how that affects data going forward. So that increasingly needs to be seen in tandem, cyber data more and more together than, than separate. And of course they are, and, and that's the reason I will point to you, Mr. Narendra Nath. You, uh, you know, with your lot of work you do around security, um, what, where, where would you see your worst nightmare, uh, disclosed nightmare? Uh, you may have certain undisclosed nightmares, but uh, wh where would you see your disclosed nightmares on this data flows and uh, the merging of, you know, uh, uh, all these issues coming together? No, the, the nightmare is not in the data flows. The nightmare is the breaches that occur. And that you see it day in and day out, you know, in major corporations and there. So where, 
it's not only government data, it's data that's there in the corporations also, that you, know, you see the data, breaches that are occurring day in and out. That's the nightmare, you know, and uh, people, it's the data that's gone out without consent of the persons who are involved. So that's the nightmare. But having said that, you know, I just want to, uh, some of the points that have been discussed in the panel, you know, when you look at it, currently there are data flows, cross-border data flows that are occurring. It's not that cross-border data flows do not occur. The only things that hi get highlighted is when there is some, you know, regulation that comes and say that this data is not to be sent across the borders. And if you look at the percentage of the data that is getting affected through these regulations, I I'm talking of, uh, you know, countries, democratic countries, I'm not talking of all the countries. It's a very small percentage of the data that is flowing across cross borders. And if you look at the type of data that people are talking about, yes, there are sensitivities in involved in it, and that's why it's happening. And coming out to, uh, and it's all a question of costs that are involved. You know, there are certain mechanisms that are put, to, that to be put in place. And because of the costs that are involved, that's why you have a pushback that's coming in. So when you talk of fine-grained access, now that's a very important concept. You really want to have fine-grained access. It means they have to re-engineering of this, the way the data is structured. And that there are costs involved in it. So it's possible that you will have fine-grained access. It's possible that you can decide what data can be shared and you could have watermarking of, you know, data so that if it's uh, for a certain purpose it's to be used, has it been used for some other purpose or has it been used by somebody else? So these are research topics and uh, things uh, work, it's happening on that. And I also talked about that multi-party compute where, you know, people could have access to data for computational purposes to get the results without having insight into the data. I mean, looking at data. Clean so these rooms. are all technical tools which are available and what will really facilitate to increase the amount of cross-border data flows that happen in addition to. And the restriction cross-border data flows have been there, you know, and like it's in sectorally, like in the telecom sector, for example, the customer data, you cannot take it outside the borders of the country. It's been there for years right from the beginning, you know, it's for the last decade it's been there. Banking sector, it's been there. So, it's, I think, it's not across the board, you're not having any restrictions. It's that specifically identified, there are some restrictions. And people opposing to restrictions might be because of the cost involved in, you know, in... So, so two things I hear from you is that, while there was a wild west, that means the gray areas, everybody operated, and suddenly when the regulation comes in, it takes that particular industry, a subset of the industry by shock and that causes the, the, the opposition slash headwinds or the cost going up and, and that, is, uh, that is true for everything in the data and digital economy today, very, very frankly. So, um, uh, Srinidhi, if I may come to you next, um, uh, what is your, uh, from, from a legal perspective, um, you know, um, we, we keep seeing um, this to be a very contentious issue, not not something that can be easily resolved. Um, uh, what, what do you think is uh, is a good case where where countries can come together, where uh, many commons, many many you know many lateral agreements can happen? What do you envision as a good good scenario in, in, for the next couple of years? Um, sure. Yeah, I think. Um I think the idea of trusted data flows, if we were able to find, while, you know, it's challenging to find consensus, but there's a certain common minimum, perhaps. Uh, every data protection, data governance legislation in the world will have a certain baseline benchmark, you know, core principles, say, like minimizing the amount of data collected, ring fencing, purpose limitation um, as well. Um, so if, if you can find that sort of common minimum benchmarking, then perhaps there is a... Um, greater chance of uh, facilitating sort of trusted trusted data flows because there is some certainty around how data will be governed when it when it goes to another region. Um, I, I also did want to weigh in on like a worst case scenario, or, you know, what what might be challenging, which which I think from a business lens, while while we advise businesses on evolving data policies as well, I think um, and when it's in a very uncertain environment and also when norms might change very frequently, I think that can can be a bit of a, ha not just a bit of a hassle, I mean, it drives up costs, it, it creates anxiety, it sort of deters investment as well. So that sort of 
environment where uh, absolutes are hard coded in the in the law but they might also change um, i think that can be a that can be a challenge and i i mean for, for domestic policy i think for india's domestic data policy i'd really love for there to be a robust regulator i think that's something to just invest in both administratively because any data governance law will be principle based and the real meat of implementation will come through in downstream regulation how the regulator governs the sector um, so I'd, I'd, I mean, just I'd, I'd look forward to a regulator being set up, which is uh, robust, which also consults with other sectoral regulators uh, and can have a whole of government sort of approach. So uh, two things I'll mention over here, uh, what Srinidhi has said, and, and I think Mr. Narendra Nath also said so. What is minimalistic data for a country A, like India, could be, you know, five data points for a particular data set. We were discussing the same with another nation, which I cannot name. They, they identified 87. So uh, the, the, the differences are so vast in what we consider a, a particular society, a particular country considers as minimalistic, the common base vis a vis somebody else. So I think it's these challenges will remain. Um, second point I do want to make, uh, and before finally I coming to, uh, coming to Michael, is that he also alluded to the same, that if you have not studied, um, apart from the legal side, do have, uh, please did, do take a look at the uh, proposed uh, techno-legal framework of DEPA that we have in India, the digital, uh, the data empowerment protection architecture, and, and have a look at it. Um, I know we are about short of time, so Michael, your final words, some provocative thoughts on the, your worst case nightmare. I always try to be provocative and concise. Uh, and again, the art... That's Twitter for you. You, are, you said you are on Twitter, so right. Twitter is both provocative and concise. I, I just, I again, point people to the chapter by Rahul Matan and uh, Sheena Raman on DEPA. It, it's a very nice overview. It doesn't get very technical, but it really frames the important issues. I'm a technological optimist and a political pessimist. I've already explained my technological dream of the future. My political nightmare is that we will have politicians who stand up and say, data is the new oil and we want our country to be the OPEC of data. And then they proceed to try to clamp down on data. Uh, this is something that's been going on for a long time. And, and the Europeans, 25 years ago, passed a database directive and it created a new copyright for databases. In the United States, you can't do that, and that's one reason the database industry has been so successful, is you can create a database by collecting data from other people. In Europe, you have this extra barrier to building databases and sharing. Luckily, the rest of the world hasn't taken that idea. But my fear is that because Europe is such a large market and because it is heavily invested in regulating digital industry, they will come up with a lot of these ideas that sound good, like providing intellectual property protection for data, and other countries will pick it up. The same thing with the idea that having a French cloud, or a German cloud, or a Belgian cloud, or a Icelandic cloud is a good idea. It's not. That guarantees that startups don't have access to some of the most exciting cost-effective new services that they need to build the applications of the future. So that's my nightmare. And it's, it's not an obvious nightmare. It's like the dog that doesn't bark in Sherlock Holmes' fav famous story. It's the thing that doesn't happen because some political decision was made long ago. Let that sink in, if you all get the joke. So, but uh, that... Uh, that has happened, by the way, uh, Musk has taken over uh, Twitter. Um, and uh, with that, thank you very much to my panelists uh, for a, a discussion on a topic that uh, sometimes, um, you know, um, if it's, it's good that we are discussing it because when, when policymakers, startups uh, get impacted by it, there is a lot of headwind, but I think it's important that we all discuss it, think about it, and the, the issues uh, at the background of uh, cross-border data flows. With that, a big round of applause to all my panelists, and thank you very much. Samir, can we leave now with your permission? May I request all of you to...